Okay, I just have to kind of do a little bit of review for you. Um, I, and I know a lot of people in this room, were, uh, were in college in the 20th century. We were schooled in the 20th century. Um, and so we think of schooling as being 20th century. 
and that is very teacher-centered. <coughs> Think back if you were in, in school in the 80s, 90s, 70s, all right? Those are times where the teacher sat up in front of you and you sat in straight rows and you wrote, you know, raise your hand if you had a question. And I don't know about you, but I had this stare that looked like I was listening and I really wasn't. Okay? Very teacher-centered. Uh, it's amazing uh, that 21st century is just like the video we saw. It's engaging. Not only is it for... The broadcast the is now starting. All learner, attendees are in listen-only mode. But it's for the kinesthetic learner, the hands-on type person. And back in the 20th century, we just completely missed that particular learning style altogether. So in the 20th century, it was very, in fact, I always laugh at myself because um, I taught uh, in the classroom in the 80s, and it was a language arts classroom. And I was such a teacher-centered teacher that when it got to be April and May, and you had to really, you know, speed it up to get through the curriculum, my idea was to talk faster, and that's serious, okay? No, I couldn't, you know, give the kids projects and have them do presentations to cover all the areas. Um, I just, you know, that's the way I was schooled. And, you know, I have to say, uh, for two years, I gone around, I talked about 21st century, and old habits are hard, hard, hard to break. Because I will always revert back to the teacher-centered classroom. And I'll go back, and I always evaluate myself. I always say, you know, yeah, I wonder how that went today. And I'll say, oh my God, I did one on um, open source apps, okay? Wonderful apps I had for those people. But instead of dividing them up and having them work on an app and, and presenting to the group, I did it all. And it was boring. I mean, I had them getting that stare that I practiced so well when I was in the classroom. And I think they went away with not too much. I evaluated myself and I said, what did you do wrong? Well, what I did wrong was I was too teacher-centered. And, 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 you know, it's one of those paradigms. You know, this is the way I was taught, this is the way I was taught to teach, and the way I taught for so long that sometimes it's just hard to, hard to change. But we do have to change. We have to blend our instruction. We have to blend our engagement with students. It has to be not only teacher-centered, but student-centered and technology-assisted to be 21st century. Okay, uh, <clears throat> engagement is a blend of teacher-centered instruction, student-centered instruction, technology-assisted instruction. Okay, the 21st century learner standards increases engagement and makes students take ownership of their learning. This is so very important, this ownership, and she talked about the autonomy. You have to let them, the students know, you know, back in my day, when you took an achievement test, they really didn't tell you where you did poorly on it, so you didn't have any idea what you needed to work on. Now, students are, are, are being uh, counseled on what they need to actually look at so the next time they take the math test or the achievement test, they can do better on it. So we're letting students take ownership of their learning and we're, we're having more teacher, or less teacher-centered instruction. Now, some people come away from my presentations and they say, oh, never teacher-centered again. That's not what I'm saying. It has to be a blend and more student-centered when possible. Okay, <clears throat> 21st century learner standards. And all of these standards, if you look at the verbs, they really do the engagement piece. Uh, inquire, think critically, and gain knowledge. If you get students to do that, they are engaged. Draw conclusions, make informed decisions, apply knowledge to new situations, and create new knowledge. They share knowledge and participate ethically and productively as members of our democratic society, and they per pursue personal and aesthetic growth. All of those verbs bring in the engagement piece. Okay, now we talked about the learning modalities. Uh, these are the sensory channels or pathways through which individuals give, receive, and store information. And each one of us has a different learning style, a predominant learning style that we learn the best at. Now, if you'll notice, <clears throat> on average, 25 to 30 percent of us in this room are visual learners. Auditory learners are 25 to 30 percent. Kinesthetic, kinesthetic or tactile learners are 15. 
Back in the day when it was all teacher-centered, these tactile learners, the ones that hands-on, the ones that like, like move around, like we saw in the video, those were the ones that were completely missed. Now with differentiated instruction in the classroom and doing more student projects, we're able to address the, um, those 15% of those learners and the others. Okay? Um, engaged learning is active. You saw that in the video. Hands-on, minds-on, eyes-on, inquiring, and it demands participation at all levels. Okay, a technology-rich classroom is engaging because students are meaningfully engaged in learning activities through technology, which is digital literacy, interaction with others, which is collaboration, worthwhile tasks, which is project-based learning and research. <coughs> oh, okay, this is, uh, at Carney High School, this is one of the um, technology-assisted um, lesson plans that we have done there that we, I've worked with the social studies teachers. If any of you have ever gone to that www.livingroomcandidate.org, you'll find that they have all of the presidential campaigns from, I think, late 1950s. I can't remember what year it starts. I think Eisenhower's in there. But uh, um, the kids go to this and they pick one of the campaigns and they analyze it. They have been studying um, they have been studying propaganda. And they take all the propaganda techniques and they apply it to what they have seen. Now, this is a wonderful way. Now, the teacher-centered part was teaching them the propaganda techniques. Then they took those techniques and they watched these videos and as a group, there was three of them in a group, they would come up with a presentation to say which propaganda technique was most used in this presidential campaign. I know we're all kind of tired of the presidential stuff right now, but this one goes well. So propaganda techniques which are name calling, transfer of blame, fear, Glittering generalities and bandwagon. Have we seen this in the uh, recent presidential campaign? Okay, I think also um, open source is a wonderful way to get students engaged uh, by using technology. Um, if any of you have not have uh, foreign language teachers that haven't used this word play, you need to be a resource for them to go here. This is a great way for students to use technology to um, uh, practice their foreign language vocabulary. Okay? Okay. Position your lessons infused with motivation and engagement should. There you go. Thank you. No. All right. I'm going to take all that they have discussed and kind of put it all together um, and share a little bit of what I do on a daily basis how I get into the classroom successfully as a school librarian, and how I, actually some of my tricks of the trade um, that seem to work for me. The first one is um, to enhance what teachers are already doing. You do not have to reinvent the wheel as a school librarian. I am an, I call myself an auditor. I walk around the school building making sure that I am listening all of the time, in the lounge, in the bathroom, in the hallways, and if I hear a teacher say, Oh, this week we're teaching that lesson one, and they'll name something. I think, aha, that's my in. And I don't even stop and talk to them then, because I, I was a classroom teacher. I was a first grade teacher for years. Taught special ed before that, so I have a lot of passion for the, for the little kids. But um, I will go back to my office, and I will send them three apps. They can download to their iPad, four websites. And I will send one of my student aides down with a pile of books out of the library to support that. I don't know if they use them. I usually hear back that they thought they were amazing, but that's my in. We didn't even have a conversation about it. Then a couple weeks later, I'll say, hey, next year, let's do da 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 And so that's usually my in for that one. So don't reinvent the wheel. The next one is to incorporate multiple standards at once. Being a first grade teacher, um, we had a lot of state standards we had to teach kids. And in fact, our report cards that we sent home each quarter were standards-based. And so we had to grade our kids 
quarterly by the state standards. And so I understand now that I'm a school librarian that if a teacher is teaching something, it's pretty purposeful. And so I let them do the, the state standards piece of it, and then I come in with the 21st century um, standards, and then we can, we can make a pretty awesome lesson. Utilize technology, that's my in. I always joke that uh, I'm a school librarian, but the, the thing that the teachers care about the most is that I'm a tech integration specialist. And if I say I'm going to bring an iPads or iPods or laptops, the teachers are game instantly. So that's my in. And then, of course, be planned, taught, and assessed together. Um, it, it's awfully tricky to try to, to marry those two, um, the state standards with the 21st century standards, if you haven't planned it together. And I was big, even when I was a classroom teacher, we were big on co-teaching um, with the special ed staff. And so in our school building, it's okay. You don't, you don't have to tell them you're coming in. If you come in, they usually just include you, which is kind of cool. All right, so here are some of my tricks of the trade. And I have a lot of these in place before I even try to teach a lesson with a classroom teacher. Um, the first one is just how I get myself out of the library. We all know that that's one of the biggest struggles we have is that we, unless you have a total flexible schedule, it is often hard to get out from behind the circulation desk. And so a couple things. The first three, I have um, a technology para that I'm very blessed to have, and I have a library para. But I justify like crazy. They are never not busy. I have taught both of them everything I know as far as even important jobs. I have taught them how to process books. I have taught them how to um, technology-wise. Um, Jamie is her name. She, she could run the show without me. So that's a huge one. The next one is parent volunteers. My parent volunteers are faithful and they are amazing. They come every day and if they do not come, they call me and tell me they won't be there. But that's because I have empowered them to be special. The kids love them and, and they know that they are amazing. And the last one is student aides. I work really hard to advertise that the elementary student aid job isn't just about shelving books, because high school kids can figure that. And so I let them do a lot of other things. I let them do some research for me. I let them find good apps that a teacher might ask for. I let them even dabble a little bit in GarageBand. If I'm working on a project, they help me edit it. So I give them a little bit of power too. Um, number four, I already talked about being an auditor. And the last one is share, 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 share. Never, never, never. If you hear something in the hallway and you know you have something supported to support it, never let it go by the wayside. Email that teacher. I've even texted a couple of them after hours saying, I forgot to send this to you today, but remind me tomorrow I have an app that you could use for that. Um, show up on time. If you tell a teacher you are coming in to co-teach with them, be there on time. Coming from a classroom teacher, having taught, if you are waiting for them to come in, you have already lost your students. So make sure you are on time. It's just credibility. Number seven, constant communication. Talked about that one. Like I said, I've even texted some of the teachers. Sometimes that's the only way you'll get them to read it. Um, number eight, student buy-in. If you show up with books and technology, many of them will be interested. If you really have a cool job and if you can advertise it, the kids will love you. Um, number nine, be the one to be to to present it in a different way. Frequently, I will find out what the teacher is already teaching. And then I will find the other multiple intelligences, ways that I can support it. Um, kind of like some of the stuff in the Ron Clark video. And then the last one is pre-teach the hearts of each kid. Um, as a special ed teacher, when I first started teaching, and so I have, strangely enough, a passion for those kids that can't sit still and for those kids that don't like to learn. And so frequently, if I know a lesson is coming up, I will say to the teacher, send me Bobby. Send me him the last 20 minutes of the day, the day before the lesson. Bobby comes in, I say, tomorrow, Bobby, you are going to be my helper. We have to teach your entire class to X, Y, Z. And tomorrow, you are going to be, even if it's the presentation remote slide term, you know, he, he has a job tomorrow, and he thinks he is so amazingly cool because he has a heads up of what's going to happen. And so frequently, um, you know, when I leave, a teacher will say, wow, that lesson went really, really 
well and Bobby was even engaged. I say, well, Bobby thought he was pretty important in that lesson. And so uh, that, that's just another one of my little tips. All right. Um, this is a lesson that I actually have used to try to advertise to the other teachers in the school building that I am not going to give them more work. I am not going to um, come into their classroom just so that I can say that I co-taught a lesson. And so frequently, um, obviously I was a first grade teacher, and so this is one of my favorite lessons because I know the other side of it. This was a language arts standard that we used to have to paper pencil teach. And um, it wasn't necessarily a fun one. It was based on the book Bear Snores On, and I, I forgot to pull it out, but it was a read the book to the students, they have to draw a picture, they have to, the advanced question was, if there's a bear knocks on your door, what would you do? And the kids, even though it was a great book, the kids hated it. And so when I became school librarian, I said to one of my dear friends, all right, we're going to jazz this baby up a little bit. And so we created, I added the 21st century standards to it, and we created a um, green screen video of these kids. Go for it, hold the slide for a little bit here. We actually use this for parents teacher conferences too, the parents love it. We had the kids do the original state standard because we needed to turn in those results to our curriculum director. But then for the advanced questions, we incorporated technology and uh, we turned it into a green screen iMovie project. And the kids still talk about it. lesson, we beefed it up. Those kids loved every minute of it. And now I have sixth graders saying to me, Mrs. Richardson, when do we get to use that big green screen that you have in your library? When are you going to let me do that? And so instantly those kids have bought in. I probably could walk in there with the worst state standard test they've ever taken in their life and tell them we're going to do something like the first graders did, and that will be one of the best days of school. It did take a little bit of time on my part, but it was so unbelievably worth it in the end that it, it, I will do it again and again and again until something new and exciting comes along. Wanted to share with you today, and maybe you have already been to this website, but oftentimes if you hear a teacher in the hallway talking about a lesson they have to teach or something, a unit that's coming up, and you think to yourself, okay, I want to help them, I want to co-teach it, but what do I do now? There are many places you can go. We all, I'm sure, as teachers and educators, have Googled the topic, and it will come to our best and plans for. And sometimes it will bring up good things, and sometimes it will make you pay for some lesson plans or to access a website. But this one is specifically for school librarians who are wanting to teach true 21st century lessons. And they have each lesson plan that is submitted has to be approved before it will be posted on the site. So it matches all the qualifications and it does a lot of the work for you. Of course, you're not going to find a perfect match, but oftentimes you can take ideas from this and you can um, tweak it to make it work for you. So this is the website. It is the handout that was back by the back. If you did not get a handout, it is on the website with all of the handouts um, and you can go there. So just to kind of give you so that you have seen it, because sometimes if, if you're 
it's working your way through this and you haven't seen it. Of course, you're going to have to click on create a new account. You already have a login. Um, you would put that in there. If you, for some reason, forgot your login, because we all have 8,000 passwords and logins and we can never remember what we used, you can get an email to you. It will make you fill in all the information about yourself, who you are. Um, it will